In the spring of 2012, biologist John Deschler planted a motion-sensitive camera deep in Portland's Forest Park. So I was right here. He captured this fleeting glimpse of one of the Northwest's most secretive creatures. So until these photos were taken, we didn't know for sure if mountain beaver occurred in the park. Two months after John's discovery, Portland Parks and Recreation set out to uncover what else might be lurking in Forest Park. So it's May 18th. It's T minus 31 minutes until the start of the bio blitz. 140 wildlife experts and volunteers converge on Forest Park to document as many wildlife species as they can find. People are going to be going out looking for birds, mammals, amphibians, uh, reptiles, fish. The goal is to understand what animals live here in order to better manage the park for wildlife. We know that in the past species were here that are no longer here and that today's species are here uh, that weren't here before. In order of Each expert-led team will target a specific wildlife group. Some participants bring nothing but a guidebook. Others come armed to the teeth. Hold an aspirator, the general collecting net. About a hundred miles ready to go today. But there's a catch. The bio blitzers must complete their survey in 24 hours, starting okay. now. Three, two, one. Our first team is led by herpetologist Laura Guterjohn. We are at Balch Creek, which is at the southern part of Forest Park. Um, we're looking for stream and terrestrial salamanders. Northwest Oregon boasts some of the continent's finest amphibian habitat. But if you want to find any, you have to know where to look. For the stream salamanders, they actually live underneath the rocks in the middle of the flow of the stream. So we're just bending over and picking up rocks and using nets to capture whatever might swim out or get swept out by the flow. So this is our Pacific giant salamander. This one's just a baby. The most exciting thing that we could find would be an adult Pacific giant salamander. Um, that we're finding the larva here tells us that they're around. The bio blitzers switch tactics to find land dwelling salamanders. Along the creek side, they leave no log unturned. These are western redback salamanders. Um, they actually lay their eggs inside rotting, decaying logs. Um, and then many of them, if they don't need to, will never leave more than a three foot radius their entire lives. They'll live in a very small spot. So we want to make sure we put these guys back in the exact same place that we took them out of. As the team fans out, the species list grows. Oregon Incitina. Uh, Dunn's salamanders. A lot of our amphibian species are what we call bioindicators of environmental health. If there's something wrong in the environment, they usually come into contact with it first. If we have a huge diversity of amphibians like we're actually finding now, that tells us that both the water habitat as well as the terrestrial, the upland habitat, is really pretty healthy and, and doing pretty well. The team tallies four species by the end of their survey. They're about to head back to base when... Oh! Ah. Yeah. Full size. Uh, oh my so god! <laughs> <laughs> I got it in the container. Oh my gosh! Oh, that we need a bigger container. And that it's the holy grail they hoped for, an adult Pacific giant, a titan by amphibian standards. I mean, this is about as big as I've seen in in the water. Yeah, this guy's about 10 inches or so, and they get to be at least 12 or 13 a lot of times. He's got all kinds of scars on him. These guys. <laughs> I told you they are fight with each other, so he's got all kinds of scars and. He's battle-hardened, for sure. Yeah, it's really amazing that right here, just down the road from the city of Portland, you can find the largest terrestrial salamander in the world. Well, Forest Park is special because it's a particularly large peninsula of mature forest, and it's being managed in a way that does benefit wildlife. So when trees fall on the ground, they remain on the ground. The creeks are free-flowing, at least until they get to the edge of the park. Deep in the Springville Old Growth Zone, entomologist Chris Marshall and his volunteers search for some of the park's most overlooked inhabitants. Whoa! Oh, oh, this is all one! This one's more like doing the regurgitation. They're hunting insects, spiders, millipedes, and the like, collectively known as arthropods. <laughs> oh, that's nice. That's great. So this is Scaphinotus. This is a snail-eating carabid. So this is a sawfly, and these are primitive wasps. So they don't have stingers yet. Right, they can't sting. Bioblitzers return from a long day of hunting, but the search has hours to go. 
Nocturnal teams head out into the evening. There could be an owl up this tree. And I, I tell you, they can be hard to see. You really have to work hard. They make themselves very inconspicuous. When all else fails, John deploys the peeper. It's a really cool little security camera that's right here. John goes to great lengths to add a species to the list. And it pays off. There she is. It's a screech owl. There's the owl's eye right there. That's her eye. That's her whole body, is the whole upper part of this screen. And if she was to look up, she's not looking up, but that's her eye. Five owl species breed in the park, and the team documents three of them. Excellent survey conditions for one group of animals can be poor for others. This bad acoustic monitoring team records nothing but radio silence. You would hear something like this. As they go by, the temperature is getting cold, and so if the insects aren't flying, there's no reason for the bats to be out other than to get water. Even so, the teams will work through the night. At first light, Dave Helter's bird crew begins their route on the park's west side. I think this chickadee is up here. Let's see if we can nail this down here. Soon, all eyes are glued to binoculars. Go Pacific Red. But you don't have to see a bird to check it off the list. Black-throated gray warbler. Put this one there. is empty. With the yeah, deadline yeah, looming, empty. Christy Reddick's bug team blankets Holman Meadow. So I laid these pitfall traps on Thursday morning. So they've been out for about two days. Got some spiders. It's a simple yet effective strategy to passively rack up species. You can do a pan or a pitfall trap in your backyard because insects are everywhere. And that's what's so great about them is that you can find them in any habitat anywhere. Okay. But these traps don't always discriminate. We caught two shrews and one shrew ate the other shrew. Back in the office, John reviews his camera trap images. That's kind of, so that is a deer mouse right there. Wait, what is this? Oh, get in here. That's a, that's a flying squirrel. Finally, the clock strikes 12.18. The time is up, officially, so thank you to everybody for participating in the Forest Park Wildlife BioBlitz. It wasn't easy work. So, you know, a little bloody, uh, in pain, but great. <laughs> and with ants, so I was happy. <laughs> Everyday Portlanders became wildlife enthusiasts. See a bunch of little bugs, but nothing. They were high-fiving each other when they caught a dragonfly. The skaters are into bugs. That was sweet. We're like, we're gonna go get a dragonfly, and we were like, we were about to give up. And we were walking back, and he saw it. the quick, like wrist flick to slam down, the quick one, yeah, and just block him in there, grab a little container, catch him up. <laughs> there we go. What became of the pitfall trap crasher? Liberation, still but not before identification. We're fairly confident it's a vagrant shrew. After a month of data crunching, the final count is in. We found almost 250 species of animal, including invertebrate animals. A handful of those were first sightings for the park. It's quite easy to come out here day after day, run the trails and feel like, well, I don't really see any mammals or any large birds or anything that looks like wildlife. Once you go small, you suddenly realize there's a lot more out there.